Welcome to What the Flock, the podcast dedicated to keeping, breeding, and raising parrots in the home. With topics from why are my babies humping each other to why is my budgie's butt covered in poo, we'll cover all the difficult topics one might need to know about while raising parrots from small to large in the home. I've been raising parrots by hand for nearly 30 years. I'm still no expert, but I sure have learned a thing or two that may just help you out. So let's see what's in this edition of What the Flock. Next on What the Flock Do I Do Now, bringing your new birdie home. The day you bring your bird home is the day the world changes for you both. For you, this is the grand moment when all of your research and admiration of birds suddenly becomes quite real. For your new bird, the momentous day can be downright scary. The breeder's home may have been the only world he's ever known. Even if your bird came from a bed shop as it's used to a constant parade of strangers, your home is something new, and so are you. If you purchased a budgie or a cockatiel, his interactions with humans have been restricted to being netted out of a group or budgie shipped to the pet store to wait to be netted again when purchased. Can you help these birds become confident pets? Of course you can. Or maybe you've taken on a real challenge, a bird that has been sold and sold again, passed from owner to owner, and perhaps mistreated along the way. This character views the world with cynicism and fear, and he figures, you're bound to be another disappointment. Can you really change his outlook? Sure you can. First thing to do is set up that cage. The cage is your birdie's castle, the place where he'll spend much, or if not all, of his time. A cage protects your bird and shields you from stuff from your bird, who is perfectly capable, if he's a parrot, of reducing prize antiques to toothpicks with his powerful beak. Choose a location where your bird can be adjacent to family activities, but not in the center of them. Your bird will feel most comfortable if his cage is against the wall so he can watch the going-ons without having to worry about anyone or bird sneaking up behind him. For example, away from large furniture that may block his view from the room and comings and goings of family and friends. Birds don't like to be startled any more than we do. Now that you've got the cage all set up, let's go get him and bring him home. A bigger parrot will require a couple of accommodations, one for traveling and one to call home. Well, that's not the case with little birds. When properly sized cage is plenty, the temptation to buy a bird, buy a cage, and stuff the former into the latter and race for home may be inviting, but let it pass. Large or small, your bird will be much more comfortable in a small box or carrier with a towel draped over it to darken the space and relax him. Put a towel on the bottom of the box of the carrier to provide the bird with secure footing and stop him from sliding all around, even if a perch is available. Place the carrier where it won't move around or fall, and you can put it on the passenger side footboard or put the seat belt through the handle to secure it to the seat. Next, you'll want to let him settle in. Put your bird in the cage and let him be. He needs time to adjust to his new surroundings. No matter how cute he is and you want to show him off, give him a little bit of time. Up next on What the Flock Are They Doing? Breeding Condition. It's a change in the bird's body to prepare for reproducing. When your budgies think that they're in breeding condition, they are primed and ready to raise chicks. And they are perky, flirty, and have that optimal hormone level to carry out the raising of a family from start to finish. These hormone levels are ideal for egg development and fertilization, as well as parenting drives for raising the resulting chicks to be healthy, confident adults. I'll try and help you understand a little bit about breeding condition. It's important. How can you tell when a pair is out and coming in into condition and how to encourage them to come into condition just for you? People ask, why bother conditioning before breeding? Well, in the wild, they naturally come into breeding condition as optimal times during the year when they are at the best conditions. At these times, there are increased light hours for finding food and water, a greater supply of fresh food, and they've just finished with their seasonal molts. You can attempt to breed your pair outside of this ideal time, but best results will always be better if you work with their natural body cycles and you'll have less of common breeding problems that often come up. 
common problems that result from a pair not being in condition, a lack of breeding motivation in your pair, irregular laying cycles, infertile eggs, abandoned eggs, poorly fed chicks, and outright abandoned chicks. It is simply because hormones play a role in a successful breeding drive for all the things mentioned, and there's a higher chance for them to be out of condition in a pair. The change in your pair's seer and behavior is an outward sign of the inward change in them. If you want them to breed as successful as possible, you'll need to work with their natural cycles during this time to get them into condition. As mentioned, the seer and behavior are the best indicators. Here are some things to look for both in your male and your female to judge when they're in and out or coming into breeding condition. Breeding condition in males, well, they have the vast majority of males have a blue seer at maturity. When the male of this color, seer, are not in breeding condition, he'll look like it's a lighter blue and even a lighter color around the seer. When they're out of condition, Males have a much lower fertility rate. The males have a deep blue and shiny even tone to their seer that you expect to see when they are in peak condition. That's what you're looking for when your male is ready to breed. When out of condition, these males have a much lower fertility rate and a lower breeding drive. Behavior to look for in males? He'll become much more vocal. He'll start to flirt and sing with anyone or anything that'll listen trying their best to impress their potential mates, and he'll stand out over the other males. His seer will change from a light, uneven color of blue or pink to a deep and even brighter blue or pink in color, depending on the mutation. Breeding conditions in females? A female who's not in condition will have a white or a blue color to her seer. This is usually the least fertile time to try and breed your female as her hormone levels are really low in a healthy hen at that point. When the female starts to come into condition, the white or brown color begins to turn a light tan or cream color to her seer. This is when it's best to set your pair into a breeding cage. By the time they're fully in condition and ready to receive a nest box, they'll be settled and ready to lay. And by this time, the pair should be well bonded and mating after spending a couple of weeks together in their breeding cage. Behavior to look for in females? Well, she'll be often more dominant and aggressive in general, and especially towards other females. She'll start chewing just about everything in sight, perches, toys, cuddle bones, and mineral blocks. Nothing safe from her. She'll flirt with males, become more vocal, and start searching out potential nesting box. Her seer will start to change from that blue-white to that deep tan. How do you encourage breeding conditions? Well, a lot of it's done through diet. In the wild, the food supplies brings a huge effect on breeding. Australia is normally very dry and finding enough food for them becomes difficult, but during the rainy seasons is when the food is abound and the budgies naturally begin to breed. High protein foods and fats will encourage breeding condition. You'll also want to increase their calcium intake with cuddle bone and mineral blocks to help with egg laying. Increase the daytime hours that they have from 8 to 10 to 12 to 14. The sunlight they have, the better they'll get from them. Since a hen produces vitamin D from natural sunlight, which is needed to absorb calcium and prevent egg binding, you'll need to make sure that she gets at least 30 minutes of direct sunlight a day, or you'll want to consider a supplement that might help compensate for that deficiency. Finally, give them a nesting box. If you've done everything right and they're in perfect conditions, they'll breed you lots of pretty babies. Next on What the Flock Do They Need? How to set up a bird cage for your cockatiel, parakeet, or parrot. So you've decided to add a new bird to your household. Before bringing home your little feathered friend, know what he needs and have all those things set up. He'll settle into his new home more securely if he quickly discovers that all of his needs are provided. Then the two of you can focus on the fun part, enjoying a new friendship. 
A quick word about that cage. The subject of selecting the best cage from all the possibilities out there will deserve its own show, but I'll say just a few words. The most important feature of a cage is the appropriate bar spacing for the size of your bird. Parakeets, also called budgies, and cockatiels needs half-inch bar spacing. A small parrot like a conure or a timid African gray needs three-quarter inch spacing, and large parrots like an Amazon, a Congo African gray, or a macaw needs one inch spacing. This is a matter of safety as the bird can get its head stuck in the bars that are too far apart for a size or even escape altogether. Giving your bird time outside his cage is a very good thing, but you don't want him loose without supervision. Getting tangled in curtain cords, lost under the couch, or even squeezing through a hole in the screen. When setting up your bird space, consider what would keep him healthy and happy in the wild. Then do a little adjusting and provide that in your home. Perches. Where, what, and how many? A bird's on his feet all the time, even while sleeping. First and most important, provide a variety of widths to perch on the inside of the cage. This gets taken care of automatically in the wild since trees always provide branches of many sizes. A bird's feet need the exercise of adjusting to different widths regularly to keep their joints flexible or serious foot problems can develop. <laughs> the plain dowel perches usually included with the price of a cage are unfortunately the worst sort. Much better are the perches that have multiple sticks that come off of them with different sizes, which offer even widths and condors. Another issue is nail trimming. Birds in the wild, well, they wear their nails down with lots of climbing and landing on rough surfaces. Indoor birds need a little more help to keep their nails under control. And a petty perch is kind of ideal. It looks like a piece of concrete that you can bolt into your bird's cage and the surface will help him wear down his nails with variable widths to stretch the foot joints. The large size is well very large and usually works with big macaws. They also have them all the way down to small bedgy sizes as well. One more type of perch should get mentioned, rope perches. They come in several widths and lengths and have the excellent property of being flexible. They have a wire core and can be bent into different configurations. Straight across the cage, a right angle, or a zigzag, rope perches are always the best fun in our cages. The cage should also hold enough perches that each bird has a comfortable resting spot, but not so many that the space feels crowded. Remember that birds tend to prefer the highest spot because that's where they feel safest. Now, as for food and bowls, a cage should have at least as many food bowls as birds, and preferably one extra. An extra bowl means each bird will always have a choice of the place it wants to eat, and everyone feels more secure when they have that many choices. Birds' metabolism runs very high, and they should consistently have access to food during waking hours. They feel most vulnerable on the cage floor. The ground is where predators lurk, so attaching food bowls to the sides of the cage is better than placing them on the floor. Many food bowls are made with hoods to minimize mess and waste, but the problem is some birds are afraid to put their heads into a hooded food dish. From the perspective of a small creature, always on the alert for dangers, this sort of bowl doesn't really seem all that safe. As for water, there are two choices, an open bowl or a water bowl. An open bowl of water can collect food, dust, or debris, while a water bottle runs the risk of getting blocked up. The best idea is to have both available at all times. When buying a water bottle, make sure to get one that clamps securely to the cage on the side, like and make sure that it's made out of glass and not plastic. The water bottles, which are supposed to be held on the cage with a loop of the wire, tend to slip. Your little birdie should have a cuddle bone and a mineral block. Both a cuddle bone and a mineral block supply your bird with needed nutrients and chance to exercise his chewing instinct. A bird's beak is always growing and the outlet for chewing helps wear it down. These items are quite inexpensive and having both benefits your bird. Toys! Everybody loves toys, including our little birdies. To choose great toys, think about what birds like to do in the wild. Parrots have a strong instinct to chew, especially the females who need to chew through wood during nesting. Toys which give the opportunity for some good chewing and shredding are always popular. Birds also like preening, both of their own feathers and each other's. Toys with lots of loose strands appeal to the preening instinct as well. 
One toy birds always like is a bell. Something about that sound, it makes them the opportunity to grab the clacker. It's endlessly appealing, but be careful. Buying those small brass clackers will come out. Some birds have actually swallowed them, so make sure you get a parrot-proof bell in your cage. Companion birds are tiny, fragile creatures compared to humans, but with the environment where he learns that everything he needs and all the safety he has in survival or nothing to worry about, a bird's playful side will come out. I hope you set up your cage for your little buddy, and he'll be ready to become your pal real fast. And now for our Pet of the Week. This is Chloe. She's an African gray parrot. She's about two and a half years old. We've had her for two years now. She's a hand-fed baby. Uh, she makes all sorts of noises right now. She's starting to speak clearly now. She also, she started saying hello, and she says, get the bird, and, um, bark, bark, bark. and she also goes, I sure would like to thank everyone for watching this week's edition of What the Flock. Feel free to find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash whattheflockpodcast. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram as Flock Podcast as well. We'll see you next time, and may the flock be with you.